Oh, hello. My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Whoa. Alrighty, so it is time for me to do my quarterly check-in of favorites, whatever I call this. Basically the best books that I read in Q2 of 2020. So I do this video three times a year for Q1, 2, and 3. And well, first let's pause and have the requisite like, oh my gosh, how has half of 2020 gone by? But also how is 2020 still going? 2020 just keeps on 2020-ing. The day I'm filming this, Kanye West announced that he was running for president. So like, I just saw that and was like, yeah, that checks out. <laughs> like, that checks out for 2020. Anyway, you may hear kitties in the background. They are finally, they've chosen this moment to finally play with a toy that I got them that I've been trying to persuade them to play with because it's got like treats in it. And I think they'll like it. So you may hear some noise from that, sorry. So anyway, in Q1, I had one, two, three, four, five, six books that made my favorites of that quarter. And those were Undercover Bromance, Jane Doe, A Princess in Theory, The Light Brigade, Demon from the Dark, and Network Effect. In Q2, I have seven books that I am going to talk about. So, so far this year, I have given 13 books a four and a half or five star. And if you don't know, on my rating system, a four and a half star means a favorite of the year and a five star is an all time favorite. So 10 of those 13 are 4.5 stars, which are ones that I would consider to be favorites of the year. I'm not sure that they'll end up being like all time favorites, but they're definitely favorites of this year. And three of them are five stars, which are all time favorites. We have one five star here in Q2 and six 4.5 stars. So pretty great. I've read a total of, I think as of July 1st, I had read 143 books. Of those 143, I gave 13 of them a 4.5 or a five star, which is I guess less than 10%, just to give you a sense of like the standard to which I am holding the books that get this rating, it doesn't mean that they're actually that good. They just, it means that for them to be that good to me, it does have a certain, I don't just give everything five stars, basically. It's fine if you do, that's totally fine. Everybody has different rating philosophies, but just to give you a sense of my rating philosophy. Anyway, I feel like I'm rambling. So let's go ahead and dive in. I'm just gonna go in random order for the 4.5s and I'll leave the five star for the last one. Okay, let's maybe, you know what, let's start with the two that I don't have in physical form. Both of these I read as audio. So the first, uh, let's go with The Man in the Brown Suit by Agatha Christie. So I love Agatha Christie. If you are a watcher of this channel, you definitely are aware of that. Agatha Christie is my all-time favorite author. And I'm actually currently working on a project where I am finishing reading all of her books written under the name Agatha Christie, uh, reading those for the first time. Um, there were eight left and I have so far gotten through four of them. And my favorite of that project definitely was The Man in the Brown Suit. And then just in general, this is like a new favorite Christie for me, I think, or like one of my favorite like upper echelon Christies. And that is because this is my favorite of her sort of thriller type books she writes. So Agatha Christie is definitely known as sort of a whodunit classic mystery author. And I would say that that is fair in terms of the majority of her books, but she does have this subgenre of books she writes that are these kind of political thrillers usually, or some sort of like spy thrillery type thing that also almost always have at least one murder in them. So there is a little bit of a whodunit piece of it, but more they're just like action adventure thriller kind of things. These are very varying <laughs> in their quality. Some of them, are objectively terrible and I don't like them. Some of them are objectively bad and I still really like them. This is an example of one that I think is the best version of this kind of book she's ever done. Uh, I wouldn't say it's even necessarily my favorite of them, but in terms of like the quality, I think of the ones that I have read, and to be fair, I do have a couple I think left that kind of go along this line. Of the ones I've read, I think The Man in the Brown Suit is the best quality. The kind of setup for this is this young woman named Anne Bedingfeld. Her father has passed away. She's kind of the genteel poverty kind of thing that you see a lot of in, in the 1800s slash early 1900s British literature. So she's from a good family, but she doesn't have any money. She's kind of trying to figure out what she's going to do. And she happens into this kind of international political plot that has her on a boat to South Africa and thrilling spy hijinks ensue from there. 
And I would warn people that this is definitely a book of its time because I believe this was written in either the 20s or the 30s in terms of definitely later in the book when you actually get to Africa, there is a lot of sort of like, like take you out of the book cringe, casual racism, casual like ideas about imperialism and colonialism and all that kind of stuff that just hasn't aged well. I don't think it's usually in the voice of the author, like the most egregious perpetrator of this ends up being a bad person. So take that with a grain of salt. But and that that honestly is what kept me from giving this a five star because it just sort of took me out of the book. And before then, I was fully in the mode of like jolly japes, like this is a fun Agatha Christie being really silly, but really fun because her political intrigue in these books is always nonsense. Like the, it always makes no sense, but she just, she just sort of sells it. It's fun. Like these are just really kind of lighthearted versions of an Agatha Christie usually. And because she actually wrote this after she came back from like a world tour that she went on with her husband and his boss, like she had just come back from basically going like around the globe and traveling to the places that she's describing. And I think she evokes travel in this time period in a really engaging way. So these are places she's actually been to and has like affinity for. I think that piece works really well. It is not a perfect book and I would give those just as content warnings if that's something you don't want to deal with. That is fair enough. But I really ended up enjoying this despite that coming in at the end and definitely it's my favorite of that project so far. The other that I have is audio and don't have a physical copy of is The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. This is basically an argument from history where the author is arguing that after slavery was abolished in the U.S., there was a provision made in the 13th Amendment, I believe, where uh, you basically, you can't enslave anyone except if they are incarcerated and how that loophole or that kind of provision in that amendment set the tone and paved the way for mass incarceration of black people and specifically black men to become the new Jim Crow after slavery was abolished and after the civil rights era of the 60s. She basically is attributing a lot of the mass incarceration problem that we have in the U.S. to essentially an, a, a different attempt to marginalize black people. This is an argument that is really well known in books talking about mass incarceration, talking about uh, any kind of like racial politics in the US post like the 1970s. Um, I've heard this argument referenced in books and it is frequently referenced in articles, podcasts, etc. So when I came to this book, I thought that I kind of knew what it was arguing at a high level and that I would enjoy it. But I, I was expecting, basically I was like, I bet I'll end up giving this like four stars. Like I'll like it, but it's not gonna blow my mind. And while it didn't quite blow my mind, I think if I had not been familiar with this argument, ended up giving this book a five star, I had to give it a four and a half star because it is just such a well-argued piece of historical nonfiction. Uh, there are people who come in and critique her or have like different arguments around her, but this core proposition she sets out in this book is hugely influential and there is a reason for that because it is very persuasively argued. I think she this is a great example of using historical, how to make an argument from history basically. Like she just does that super well in this book and as a piece of nonfiction, even apart from the content, which is really important, especially in this current moment, apart from that even, this is just like a very well done piece of nonfiction that I would highly recommend to anyone who is an enjoyer of historical nonfiction. Um, so this is excellent. I don't need to gas this book up because it is already very well known and loved, but I can just say if you are like me and kind of had been putting it off, honestly, because I was like, yeah, I kind of know what this says. It is still very much worth your time to actually go in and read the book itself. Like it as a work unto itself is just excellent. Okay, and then we'll take a turn to a very different kind of book. <laughs> which is When She Purrs by Ruby Dixon, which I guess, you know, the re the related point here is that this is a sci-fi romance and often in this type of sci-fi romance, which is uh, aliens and humans getting together, the underlying thematic content is basically intercultural or interracial romance. So there you go. There's maybe the tie-in topics around race here on Earth. Anyway, this is just a really, so Ruby Dixon, I think I talked about this in my June wrap up. Ruby Dixon, I have so much admiration for because she writes under this pen name anyway, in a very campy subgenre of romance. And she serves you that camp. Like you're coming to this for like a lighthearted, fun, good time kind of romance. She gives you that. These, all of the books in her Rizdiverse, which is, this is a part of, uh, they are all 
marriages of convenience basically because in this world she has set up women human women um have been abducted from earth and they are basically trafficked and they have escaped have been given land on this remote planet to live off of but they are still under constant threat from various nefarious elements and without having somebody to help protect them they honestly are just like at physical risk and their land is likely to get taken from them so they are entering into these marriages of convenience to secure their land and so you get like all of the campy fun of having like an inner alien human romance that's so fun it's well done there's sexy times in this that are fun like all of that what i think sets these books apart though is you can tell even just from that setup there's like some ser like there is some serious baggage to that kind of a setup for a romance and in a lot of these the authors kind of just deal them deal with that in like a more cursory way like they don't really get into it ruby dixon like really i think insofar as this kind of book allows, explores and examines trauma. That is really like the thematic content of these romances is people who have experienced trauma, who are outcasts from society and have been like physically, sexually, emotionally abused. Just no getting around that. She takes those themes and like that is what these romances are really about. They're not, are they gonna get together? Because they're marriages of convenience, they're getting together. It's about like, can they work through their past baggage to really have a true relationship? I just think she does that really well. And in this one, both the heroine and the hero have that kind of uh, past story of being enslaved in different ways. And so they both have baggage from that. They're both really nice people who like just had a really big misunderstanding. He comes from a species of aliens that's very akin to cats. His attempt to court her, she did not receive. And so she thought he was threatening her, but he was actually trying to like court her uh, because he like would kill things and bring them to her doorstep. <laughs> I just love that. So anyway, it may, like, it's campy, it's fun. Um, so you have all of that, but then you have them also just like working through their history. I just think that these are great examples of having fun romances that are, that are campy, that are just like kind of over the top, but can actually still be infused with like genuine pathos that is not cheap. So anyway, I really admire what Ruby Dixon does. I think these are fun. If you're looking for something fun, light romance, sci-fi romance that actually has like some real shit going on in them, this is great. And you know, we'll go on a similar note here of a romance kind of book that has real pathos to it. And we will say that Beach Read is a romance, but I think that it definitely straddles the line between general fiction and romance. Like it's a romance. Like it has alternating points of views between the hero and the heroine. Um, it has a, hap like the romance is like one of the main plots. It is a romance, but again, I think this is one that I've seen several people who pick this up expecting something sort of like rom com -y, light and fluffy, being taken aback at like how much emotion is in this. This definitely made me cry. I think it made a lot of people cry. And it is, you know, I don't think this cover is wholly misleading because there is a very light touch to this romance, like, and it's funny. I mean, at least it made me laugh. Humor is always subjective. It's a funny book and it does have a very breeze, easy breezy kind of pro style. This makes me want to read more from Emily Henry to be t totally honest. But there's some real stuff happening in this in terms of past of like uh, family issues. And the setup for this is two writers who are on vacation trying to write a book. Both of them have writer's block. So they, they, they went to grad school together. So like they know each other and they kind of, she at least didn't like him. And uh, they kind of have a past history where he looked down on her for being more into romance novel stuff. And she kind of thought he was a lit thick dude bro who was just really pretentious. So they agreed to swap genres. So for the summer, he's gonna try to write his version of a romance. She's gonna try to write her version of a lit thick book and love ensues. But to me, what really sets this apart is A, I think the writing is just very readable and, and a really fun time to spend, like, this is a book that was fun to spend time in, basically, just because of the writing. It was a real pleasure to read. And then for me, I mean, both of them have issues, like daddy issues, basically. And for me, I really connected with the heroine in this one because her daddy issues stem from the fact that her father has passed away. She had a very specific idea of what their family life was like. And when he dies, she finds out these secrets from him that completely recontextualize how she has always seen her family and how she always saw him. And uh, my father passed away a year and a half ago. Wow, actually coming up on two years now. Wow, that's crazy. Where does time go? Um, and I think she captures a lot of what is very 
hard and confusing about the death of a parent. I mean, luckily in my case, I didn't find out like secrets my dad was keeping, but it does, I think one of the things she really captures is that when, when one of your parents dies, it really does change your existing family's dynamic. Uh, if, you know, if it was a two parent household, like it changes your existing family and how you relate to each other. And that is as painful, like going through that process is as painful as the loss of the person. And I think she captures that really, really well. And in a way that I don't think I've ever seen in a book before. So I felt very seen by that piece of this of like, yeah, part of what is painful is not just you know, so this person being gone, but like your existing family isn't the same anymore. Like it's just, you have to have new, new traditions, new ways of relating to each other, new ways, you know, going through the process of someone dying changes, like brings out different sides of people and you have to like kind of re contextualize how you think about people in light of that. Like it's just, it's a, it's a painful process. And I think she, she captures that really nicely. And to me, that was what took this from a four to a four and a half for me was that I thought there was a real emotional resonance and truth to her dealing with the loss of a parent. So anyway, this is a romance, like it's really good. If you want a romance that does have some like real emotional heft to it, like you're gonna have a, this is overall a really fun book. Like I enjoyed this, but I did appreciate those heavier elements because I thought they really rang true. Okay, then we can go with Exhalation by Ted Chiang. This is one that I thought just, I'd heard a lot of hype about this. I don't, I mean, this, these are, this is a short story collection, so I'm not sure how much specifically I really want to get into because I feel like you should just enjoy the short stories that are there. But this is a sci-fi, like a speculative fiction literary short story collection. And it is so good. I was expecting to enjoy it because I'd heard a lot of hype about this book and then this author. Uh, and I, I get it now because even though the writing... The writing is solid, like it's, it is really, it's nice, simple prose. I think that, that thematically each of these stories really has a real heft to them and it has a point of view. And I really enjoyed this author's point of view. It just was a joy to read. And, and there's, you know, in any short story collection, you're going to have ones you like and dislike. Usually, I would say that actually this is a rare situation where I didn't dislike any of the short stories in this. I just had ones that I thought were better than others. And there's a real range here in terms of the type of speculative fiction it is. And I think that there's a real, yeah, there's just like a real weight to his storytelling and a real humanity. I think that's where sci-fi for me can get, can lose me if it gets into like more hard sci-fi. I think sometimes it can get sort of the same way that for me in fantasy worlds, world building can get a little masturbatory. I think sometimes like the tech of hard sci-fi or like that piece of it can get a little masturbatory where it's like, okay, I'm really happy that you're excited about this, but you actually have to tell me a story. And I never feel like that's kind of where he goes, even in the stories that I do think are true, like hard sci-fi. Anyway, I definitely want to read more from this author. I totally saw why this was so hyped up. And I would definitely, if you're interested in this, recommend it. A different kind of speculative fantasy slash sci-fi, I never really know. I feel like this is more honestly sci-fi, even though there are shapeshifters in these, because I think there's, it's always, it's not rooted in magic. There's, I should say, well, this is the Side Changeling series, and I can't tell you much about this actual book because it's the 19th book in this series. So we'll just get into a discussion of the type of paranormal romance this is or urban fantasy romance. I, I don't, I kind of feel like maybe this is better discussed as a sci-fi romance because there are two flavors of paranormal books. There are ones that have magically basis of the paranormal and there's ones where it's more sciencey based of the paranormal. This is more of a sciencey based one like there's a lot of talk about like genetics and like um, there's two different main supernatural or paranormal creatures in this. One are the psi and they have different kinds of psychic abilities and they're very much talked about in, in sciencey kind of terms and like a big part of what they did historically was try to like create children from different houses. Like genealogy is a big thing to them because they're trying to like create children with specific abilities, like specific psychic abilities. And then there are also shapeshifters or like changeling groups in this world. But again, that is always understood as like a science thing. So like you know, they can have like genetic mutations that affect them. So anyway, all that to say, in terms of the type of paranormal or urban fantasy type stories these are, they don't have magic in them. 
it's more it's just like a speculative world set in the near future in the San Francisco Northern California kind of area though recently they have been branching out to different parts of the world including Russia which is what this one has I think this is a really fun and excellent entry in this series. Like, I think this is one of the best books in the series because this was a really fun play on the whole faded mate trope that runs throughout the series. This is the first time in the series where there's an instant mating. So like the mating bottom immediately opens up between them on a psychic level. They are mates. There's no mating dance. And I thought that this was a fun, like this is a great example where she continues, Nalini Singh, who is just a queen, all of her books are so good. She continues to find interesting ways to play on the core rules of her world and to have new conflicts between her characters. And there was a little run there where I was worried she was sort of running out of gas on doing that. But the last couple of books have reminded me that like, yes, she is still finding fresh ways to get people together in these worlds. And I just thought that this was an excellent example of, of her doing that. Also the heroine in this couple is the first alpha female we've seen who is like the alpha of her pack. And she's the, the alpha of this like really badass wolf pack in the middle of Russia. And the hero is a Sai, who's one of the psychic characters. And he has like, basically he's super damaged and coming into their community heals him. Oh, these books are so good, guys. Read the Psy Changeling books. If you like sci-fi, paranormal romance at all, these books are so good. And they always have such good political intrigue and political machinations. And I can't wait to see what happens next in the world. I have to wait till like next June to find out, but oh, so good. And this broke me out of a reading slump. So there you go. Bonus points for that. Okay, so those were all my 4.5s. And then we come to my five star. And this, like, I just... This is just so good. This is one of my favorite romances I have ever, ever read. I love this book, guys. Take a hint, Danny Brown. Like, I don't, I just need you to read it. Like, I don't even want to tell you much about it. In terms of the tropes that's in here, it is friends to lovers. It is a fake relationship. Well, what else? What other tropes could we list here? Plus size heroine, um, interracial romance, hot rugby guy who teaches young boys to fight the patriarchy through a charity he works with. Like, oh, it's so good. I love this book so much. And it is so funny. That is what makes this book like, that's what takes this book to the next level. The banter and the, between these two characters is so good. And I thought that this is one of those books, this is a great example of a romance where there's no like, lingering every single scene builds on the last one and like takes you to a new place in the relationship and in the story i believed all the conflicts in here these red like real people i thought that it was a nice balance of external and internal conflict it just is so so good it's such a delight i had a smile on my face the entire time i was reading this and you should just go read it it is so good just put it in your eyeballs guys it's so good if you can't tell that's why it was my five star because i i was like well, there's a couple of things here and there that might be wrong with it, but it doesn't matter. Like, I don't care. I just, I just love the stuffing out of this book. Okay. And those are my favorite books of Q2, aka my favorite books from April to June, and a recap of my favorite books of January to June in general. Thoughts are, I've had, just looking at the, the list here, I do have a, a high representation of um, sci-fi this year. And some of that is that I'm doing Operation Sci-Fi, so I guess that makes sense. But like, even just like sci-fi romance too? I don't know. It seems to be a pretty good year for sci-fi. Another really good year so far for me in romance. Last year was a great year in romance and this year so far. I think some of it is that I'm getting better and better at picking the books in that genre that I know I'm gonna like. But I feel like it's been a really good year so far in terms of reading, so hopefully we can keep that same energy into the back half of the year. Here's hoping. So let me know some of your favorite books this year so far. What have you been enjoying? What have you been loving? Let me know that in the comments below. And yeah, I think that that will do it for now. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below, along with a link to register to vote. And yeah, I think that will do it. I hope you are having an absolutely lovely day today, and I will just talk to you soon. Bye!